Hi there. I'm Marcus Helberg. I am a developer advocate at Vaadin. I've been doing all kinds of stuff on the web for the past 15 years or so, and that includes everything from like enterprise Java stuff to bleeding edge front end development. In my current work as a developer advocate, I've really had the opportunity to go to a lot of interesting conferences, talk to a lot of really smart people, and just in general get a good sense of where the web platform is today and what we might be able to expect from the future. So in this talk I want to share some of that experience with you. Now I'm a developer, I really love coding, I spend a lot of time coding or at least as much as I can, uh, but staying on top of things can be pretty exhausting at times. There's always like a new framework, a new, new tool, new pattern, something that you should be learning. Uh, this blog post here you've probably seen, it's from last year, but as you probably know, things haven't exactly calmed down since then. So uh, I, I think it's really good for us to take a step back once in a while and just look at the big picture, see what's driving all of these new web technologies that we're seeing. And I really think that understanding this context in which all of these things are happening will help kind of both ease your mind in terms of like, no, not every front end framework is completely new and something that requires you to learn everything from scratch. So we'll take a look at where the web is today, how we got there, and what I think we can expect to see in the near future. The talk itself is going to be fairly high level, but I'll throw in some code here and there to just help clarify some points and uh, keep you awake. So just a few years ago, the situation for the web wasn't all that great. In 2010, Wired even pronounced it as dead. So how did we get to this point from the web's really glory days a couple of years earlier when it had really just started taking over most of the desktop app usage? Well, I'd argue that mobile happened. So today, if we look at the digital media use that we do, uh, mobile makes up a really big part of that. Actually, somewhere around two thirds of the time we spend on digital media is being spent on mobile devices. But things aren't really that straightforward. So if we take a closer look at how uh, people are using mobile devices, we can see that for web, uh, people are actually visiting almost three times more web pages than they are using apps on a monthly basis. But if we take a look at how much time they spend on each of these, we can see that they're spending almost 20 times more uh, of their time inside of apps than they are on websites. So uh, clearly people use the web on mobile still, but it's really not able to engage the users, uh, not able to keep them actually using uh, the web experiences. So what's going on here? What is it that makes native mobile apps so much more attractive to users? Well, it turns out that the web hasn't really been able to deliver the level of sophistication and usability that users expect and demand. And a lot of this uh, stems from the fact that the web predates many of the application requirements that we have today. So the web wasn't initially designed to do things like build applications. It was uh, built to just serve web pages, uh, hypertext that was linked together. Uh, it also wasn't really designed to deal with things like offline situations or intermittent or high latency connectivity. Native mobile platforms, on the other hand, they were designed with these constraints in mind from day one. So if you build a uh, native application, you need to take into consideration the device size and the connectivity and all of these things in order to build the application. And this is something that allows you to build a really top level user experience. So in short, the web really just hasn't had the tools needed to build the uh, kind of level of user experience that uh, users want. But it hasn't been all fun and games for native app developers either. So a while back uh, I was attending a conference and it was the last day. Uh, this was a conference where we had a booth so I had just packed the booth and some of the guys from the other booths around uh, decided that we'd go out for a couple of beers afterwards and we headed to this uh, beer place just down the street and there were probably 10 10 or so of us and the place had probably around 100 beers on tap 
the problem was that they only had two menus for like the entire restaurant and the waiter being helpful just told us that no worries like there's a there's an application that you can use to to check out the beers and make your selection and considering that the nobody from the group was from that city uh, nobody was ever going to come back there you could almost like hear a collective note from the table like nobody was willing to go through all the effort of finding the application in the application store and installing it just to select one beer one time in that one restaurant so uh, there was a clear uh, reason why we would have gotten a benefit from this application but still nobody was willing to go through all of that hassle and that's really the problem a lot of the times when building native applications is that nobody really wants to install them. So according to a Comscore report from last year, nearly half of smartphone users don't, don't download any apps in a given month, and the average user downloads only two applications. They continue that while we haven't really reached peak app, uh, they are seeing that there's a tightening in the market and uh, app developers really start to think about uh, how to kind of get access to their users. Similarly, Gartner predicted earlier this year that by 2019, one-fifth of brands would abandon their mobile applications as they're not really getting the value that they had hoped for out of the applications. The biggest issue with getting users into your native application is something called friction. So basically friction is the effort it takes for you to get off your ass and do something. So think about static friction. How much work are you willing to go through in terms of searching the app store, typing passwords, etc., etc., in order to get into the application and actually use it? So what we're essentially doing with native applications is that we're forcing people to buy before they even get to try what our application is. The web, on the other hand, has a very good solution for this. It's called links. So anyone with a link uh, regardless if they find it on Google or a friend gives it to them, are able to just click on that link and immediately start using the application. So we can see that both native and web clearly have pros and cons. So for native apps, we uh, have the problem of having these big uh, expensive in terms of development costs for different platforms, uh, big in terms of download size application that require the users to go through all of this hassle to get into the application. But if you do get a user actually uh, installing your application and they start using it, they're going to get a pretty good experience doing that. Web, on the other hand, gives users a very easy way to get into the application and start using it. But once they do use, start using it, they're not really getting that level of, of usability and engagement that native applications are providing them. So it's 2017, I think it's fair to ask, uh, can't we just like have our cake and eat it too? I mean, if we can't have flying cars, surely we can at least solve this simple thing. I mean, we're right now in a situation where there's an increasing amount of devices, situations where users could benefit from having apps like physical web, like in the restaurant just earlier, AR, VR, and so on. But at the same time, we're in a place where it's getting more and more difficult to get users into application and more and more expensive for us to build them as the set of devices that we need to target and the set of native platforms that we need to target is increasing. So uh, it turns out that the web hasn't been slacking off though. Instead, it decided to get in shape and go out for a run and Wired even uh, resurrected it last year. So things are definitely looking up. So what happened? I think, in my opinion, one of the most important changes in recent history of the web was in 2013. And it was when a group of industry thought leaders, specification workers, uh, browser vendors sat down and outlined this manifesto for an extensive web. Basically, they realized that it would be really difficult to evolve the web platform at the speed that we need to evolve it if the browser vendors are the only ones doing the work. So instead, what they proposed was that we'd open up these low-level APIs in browsers and allow library and framework developers to increase the capabilities of the web itself by extending uh, technologies like HTML and CSS. So if we break things down a little bit, I think there are four main things that have been holding back the mobile web. The first is a lack of a component model. The second is a lack of an application model. 
Third, we haven't had the performance and reliability that we need to have for application. And finally, we haven't been able to integrate with devices as closely as we want to. So let's take a closer look at each one of these and see how the web has been able, able to solve these. Typically, one of the first things we need when we're building a complex application is a way to define reusable components with interfaces. By doing this, we're basically isolating much of the complexity of the system as a whole into these components so it becomes easier for us to reason about the system. I mean, it would be pretty hard to build or maintain a system, say like an app like Gmail, if the biggest building blocks we had were things like spans and divs. Now this is a problem that many have solved over the years. We have frameworks like Dojo, jQuery, YUI, more recently React, Vue, Angular, that have introduced their own component models. But without the browser support for these component models, uh, there are a couple of problems. So first of all, we need to turn all of these into divs, spans, and a, basically a pile of JavaScript in order to run them in the browser. And second of all, they are tied to this one specific framework. So if we have a React component, we can't really use it easily in Vue or uh, the other way around. So uh, we're building a lot of these components that are just specific to one single framework, which kind of slows down progress as we need to reinvent the wheel every time we come up with a new framework. So the web solution to this is called Web Components. And what Web Components do is they offer a platform standard way to define components as custom HTML tags. The HTML gets run exactly the same way you wrote it in your source code, and the browser takes care of all the heavy lifting. So if you look at the video here, you can see that the Vaughn date picker that we just uh, wrote is actually the Vaughn date picker that runs in the browser. There are two primary standards that are used for creating web components. The first one is called custom elements and unsurprisingly it's used to define new HTML elements. It's basically an ES6 class that extends from HTML element then you associate that class with a tag name. So whenever the browser encounters my component tag in the DOM, it will instantiate this My Component ES6 class. The other spec is called Shadow DOM. What Shadow DOM does is it lets us hide the inner workings of our component from the main document. So it allows us to kind of bundle and scope the styles of our component without having to expose those to the main document, then potentially then kind of breaking styles in that. The Shadow DOM can also help with framework interoperability and removes a lot of the brittleness that we have from uh, styles and functionality leaking into the main document. So if we run this code, uh, you can see that our component that we just looked at will run in the browser exactly the same way we wrote it. The content will be inside of the shadow root where it's hidden from the rest of the document. So finally, we now have a good standard way of defining reusable components on the web, a way which is not tied to one specific framework, rather it's something that the browsers understand natively by themselves, something where we can write a component once and actually use it with different frameworks and even without frameworks. The second major piece that has been missing on the web is an application model. When you're writing an application, obviously you know you're writing an application, but the browser really doesn't. So every time you go to a new page in your application, as far as the browser is concerned, you're just going to a new website and everything kind of needs to start from scratch. So again, there have been countless tools over the years that have offered solutions for this. They've given us a way of bundling our application and giving us access to APIs that we normally wouldn't have access to. But these hybrid solutions also have one big drawback. They disconnect the application from the web. So in order to get all the functionality of the application, people would still need to go and install the application from the application store, like a native application, with all the same drawbacks. So we're kind of gaining something in terms of being able to build an application in one set of languages, uh, web languages, and be able to run that on different platforms 
but as far as the end user is concerned, they're still uh, having to go to, through all of this extra effort in order to use the application. So this is where progressive web apps come in. Progressive web apps are really the web standard solution to building application. Now while I was making this presentation, I really tried finding a logo for PWA, uh, but I couldn't find one, so I made this. I eventually, after a lengthy and super serious discussion on Twitter, I did manage to find the kind of official logo for PWA, but I was pretty attached to the one I made before. But thanks to a community member, we managed to make a pretty good compromise, I think, uh, that fulfilled both mine and their requirements. So uh, we made this. Anyway, uh, let's get back to what I was talking about. So Alex Russell, uh, the person who coined the term PWA, likes to point out that PWAs are really just websites that took the right vitamins. So they're not like an entirely new set of, uh, or an entirely new technology. Rather, they're just kind of websites that get enhanced. And that means that there are a couple of new technologies involved that you need to learn, but most of the things that you need are things that you already know, so HTML and JavaScript, responsive layouting, and so on. The two main technologies that you need to add to your toolbox in order to build PWAs are Application Manifest and Service Worker. So let's take a quick look at both of these and what they actually mean. So if we start with the easier one, the web app manifest is a JSON file that identifies a web app to the browser. It's basically just the contents of all of those meta tags you already have in your header, just collected into one JSON file. You then link this JSON file uh, from every one of the pages that make up your application. And by doing that, you're telling the browser that all of these pages should be considered as one application. So that's Pretty, pretty simple. The second technology, Service Worker, is a bit more complex. So it's basically a standalone web worker that you can use as a network proxy. The Service Worker allows us to provide a reliable experience regardless of network conditions, exactly the same way as native applications do. So whenever your application makes a request for the network in the Service Worker, you'll have the possibility of deciding what you want to do with that. Do you want to go to the network or do you want to return something from the cache or maybe you want to return something from the cache and then go to the network and refresh the cache? That's all up to you. So you get full access to deciding how you want to deal with situations like this. Uh, one thing to point out is that since Service Worker has full control over the network calls your application makes, it's only available over HTTPS to make sure that you're actually running the service worker that you're meant to run. So using a service worker is fairly straightforward. Uh, you can check your uh, browser for support by checking if you have a service worker in your navigator. If you do, you can call serviceworker.register and pass in a service worker JavaScript file. This is just a normal JavaScript file. The file itself is entirely event-driven, so we can add listeners for all the types of events we want to react to. In this case, uh, as an example, we're listening for fetch events, so whenever our application tries to reach out to the, uh, reach out to the network. In this case, I'm going to respond with something, and what I'm going to respond with is, uh, first I'll check my caches if I have a match for the request. If I do, I'll just return the cached response. If not, I will delegate to the network and just pass on that fetch. So uh, this is just a very simple example. I'm obviously omitting some detail, but it gives you a good idea of the type of flexibility and power that you get in handling network requests in a service worker. The service worker is also able to handle other types of events. For instance, if you have a server that emits push notifications, so things like say your order has been shipped or your invoice has been paid, uh, the server can send out a push notification that a service worker can uh, handle. So in this case, we're gonna listen for the push uh, event. We're gonna construct a message. So we're gonna give it a title, some options with a body and an icon. And then we're going to call show notification with the title and the options. And this will then 
show a native notification on whatever platform the user is on. So some of the other things you can do with a service worker are things like background syncing data. So if you have, say, like a news application and you want to make sure that the user has some fairly recent articles to read, even if they uh, happen to start the application while they're away from a network, you could do that. Uh, there have been talks about adding things like geofencing uh, as well in the future. So I think a lot of interesting new functionality on the web will be uh, built on top of the service worker. So if your app has taken these vitamins, that is, it has a service worker for caching and it has an app manifest identifying itself as an application to the browser, it will gain some superpowers. So on the first load, whenever you get to the application the first time, uh, through Google, through a link somebody sent you, it will look like any other web application, but in the background that application will install a service worker. Now if you continue to use the application, uh, the browser itself will give us this little install pop-up saying that, hey, it looks like you're kind of using this application quite a lot. Uh, would you like to install this to your application so you can access it more easily? Uh, if you then decide to add it to your home screen, it will uh, get integrated into your application, uh, into your uh, device, so you'll have a icon for it, it will show up in your task switcher and so on. And really to most non-technical users and probably even technical users, it will just look, feel and behave like a native application would. So when you start this application, it will start up full screen mode. Uh, you can continue working exactly where you left off in the browser. And it's just a very kind of seamless experience. And really, if you think about it, what this approach allows us to do is it allows us to take this really uh, not so nice kind of buy before you try installation model that native applications have and turn it into a much nicer try before you buy experience. So people can actually start using the application and only decide to install it if it makes sense for them. So the web finally has an application model. Finally, uh, let's take a look at runtime performance and device access. So you probably heard about WebAssembly. WebAssembly basically is a technology that allows us to take source code that's in a type language like C or C++ and compile it into a binary format. To understand really the benefits of this, uh, we need to understand a little bit about how the browser works. So when we're running JavaScript, the browser engine goes through several steps to optimize the source code, parse the code, then it will start running it in an unoptimized way. And when it finds places that you uh, in the program that get used more and more, it will then successively keep optimizing those to get a really optimized code that ends up running in the browser. But all of this kind of in-place optimization comes with a performance penalty. So what WebAssembly essentially allows us to do is just hand the pre-optimized code to the browser directly. So it doesn't need to go through all of these steps. Instead, it can just run a already optimized piece of code directly. Now WebAssembly is uh, designed to be efficient both in terms of download size and in terms of load time. So it's very quick, uh, or it's for the amount of code, it's very small to download, very fast to load. And when executing, it can easily be 10 to 100 times faster than JavaScript for, for some operations. So some of the more obvious use cases for uh, WebAssembly would be things like games, video codecs, filters, uh, image manipulation, uh, basically any kind of heavy business operations. You might have things spreadsheets. In, in basically any any kind of operation that requires a lot of co computation and doesn't necessarily need to uh, edit the DOM directly. So WebAssembly, we're very much the same way as a web worker can't access the DOM directly. Rather, it's something that the main thread would have to call and delegate to. But uh, what WebAssembly really allows us to do is break down a lot of the performance barriers that web apps have had in the past and just allow us to uh, deliver a whole new 
class of applications that run natively on the web. The final missing piece is the APIs we need for really giving this seamless app-like nice rich experience and these are the thing APIs for things like authenticating ourselves, doing payments online, accessing our co contacts, uh, running really efficient 3D uh, stuff in the browser, uh, dealing with persistent quotas, Bluetooth, so on. And it's really nice to see that the web is evolving very fast in terms of these things and uh, we're seeing browsers starting to implement a lot of these APIs natively which allow us to build the kind of level of user experience and functionality that our users want. So if we sum up it, uh, what we've looked at so far, we've looked at web components which are a component model for the web. We've looked at progressive web applications which are an application model for the web. We've looked at WebAssembly, which is a highly performant way to distribute and run computation-heavy code in the browser. So if we combine these, we, in a sense, get web-native applications. So we're getting applications that run natively, just not on iOS or Android. They're running natively on the web platform itself. So I know what you're thinking at this point, then you just like... Tell us in the beginning that you're going to make us less stressed about about new technologies and then you proceeded to tell us about all of these new technologies and what's going on. So the good thing here and really the common thread in everything is that all of these technologies build on web standards. So if there's only one thing you take out of this presentation, it would be my recommendation to just spend some time and try to explore what the web platform offers. I think you'll be pretty surprised by how much you can do without any frameworks, any tools. I think that by understanding the web platform, you'll gain a lot of insight into the problems that a specific library or a framework is trying to solve. And a lot of times you might even understand that whatever problem that library or framework is trying to solve isn't really relevant to what you're doing. And it's not something that you really need to stress out about uh, having to learn. Now that said, uh, once you do understand the underlying technologies, there's certainly nothing wrong with using tools. So as you saw, some of the APIs for building things like web components and service workers are pretty low level. And in a sense, that was the entire idea of the extensible web manifesto, exposing these really low level APIs so that library and framework vendors can build on them. So if you want to build web components, there are several good libraries that make that easier. You may want to take a look at Polymer, which is a Google project or Stencil by the Ionic team. They take very different approaches to building web components, but in both cases, what the end result is, is just a standards compliant web component that you can run interoperably. So you could run a Polymer component with Stencil or a Stencil component with Polymer or run either a Polymer or Stencil component with any other library. So uh, even though they take very different approaches to uh, building the component, you end up with the same end result. If you're looking at building PWAs, you also have a ton of tools available to you. Most framework CLIs and starter kits already start supporting PWA by default. So they'll allow you to build some fairly sophisticated apps without needing to know all the hairy implementation details. I mean, you might already have started building a PWA even without knowing it. If you're not using one of the frameworks that already have support for PWA built in, you could take a look at Google's Workbox project, which is a helper that allows you to build a service worker, both build time and runtime to handle all the types of situations that you want. Now when it comes to WebAssembly, I think that most of you will start seeing the benefits of that mostly through the libraries that you use. So as your libraries start using WebAssembly to make parts of them more fast, more, uh, more performant, you'll get the benefits of that in your application. So that's a pretty kind of sweet deal. You can get performance improvements without really having to do a whole lot in your application. If you want to start using uh, web components yourself, 
Uh, there are certainly tools for that already, but I also suggest that you take a look at uh, Webpack. They recently got a pretty sizable grant from the Mozilla Foundation to add support for WebAssembly and really streamline the process of having a project where you have source files in different languages. So you'd have like C++ and uh, JavaScript and HTML files in the same project and Webpack would then build everything and link everything together as needed. So it's perfectly fine to start getting excited about all of this right now because everything that I showed you are things that you can start using today if you want to. So all major browser vendors are on board with the specs. Most are already shipping implementations. Uh, when it comes to web components, they are polyfillable back all the way to IE 11. Uh, since Safari and Chrome already have native support, you already have native support on most modern uh, mobile devices, which is really nice. Uh, for progressive web apps, the support is being added very rapidly across all browsers, but the nice thing there is that it's a progressive enhancement. So you can add a service worker to any application without uh, making the experience worse for anyone, but it's going to make the experience better for a big portion of your users. There are already a bunch of big names uh, like Twitter, Washington Post, that are running progressive web applications in production. And YouTube is a really good example of a big site that's built with web components, Polymer in this case. So in conclusion, I think we're in for a kind of revolution. I think that we're seeing the browser starting to become more and more like the operating system. Native apps, they're definitely not going away, but I think they're becoming more specialized and more niche as we're moving forward. For most developers, native apps just won't be worth the extra cost of development and marketing for all the different platforms. Having more apps run natively on the web will also open up a lot of exciting new possibilities for new device manufacturers, uh, device types, operating systems, and so on to enter the market. Because as long as they can provide a browser, they'll give you access to this thriving app ecosystem. I also think that emerging markets will help drive uh, us towards this future uh, because the app model that the web offers uh, where only the used parts of an application need to be downloaded and only the chart changed parts of the application need to be updated when an app uh, gets updated is very well suited for the types of uh, high cost, low bandwidth networks that we're seeing in emerging markets. So there's no need to, uh, for users to download several hundred megabyte updates every two weeks. As a developer, uh, this is a pretty exciting proposition because as long as you understand and know the web platform, you can be a part of this. I think that having standards to build on will really help speed up the pace of innovation in the future, but also give us a solid foundation for building all of this in a stable way. I also predict that frameworks will become smaller, more, more focused, more modular as a result of all of these interoperable standards. In the long term, this may mean that you don't need to use frameworks the same way that you do today. Instead, we'll pick our framework components, uh, we'll tie them together with a router of our choice, we'll maybe use a state management system of some sort. We're just kind of, mi kind of mix and match uh, pieces from here and there to build the kind of framework that we need for our specific application that we're building. Since all of these pieces are built on uh, top of the same standards, they're gonna be interoperable by default. So while it's 2017 and we don't have flying cars yet, at least we have drones, they're pretty cool too. And while we don't have a technology for having our cake and eating it too, at least now we have apps to order more cake while we're having our cake. So I think things are pretty awesome anyway. In closing, uh, I just want to say a couple of words about Vaden, the company I work at. So we're originally a Finnish company. The name Vaden is the Finnish word for a reindeer. We're an open source company that's focused on helping developers build really great user experiences on top of the web platform. And it's something that we've been doing for the past 16 years, just building components, tools, frameworks uh, to help our community members and customers uh, deliver these awesome user experiences. We have a really nice set of open source Apache licensed web components that you can use for any projects, work or hobby. They're customizable and you can 
uh, make them really fit into the application that you're building. We also ship with a material design team. You can find all of these elements on our website, vaan.com slash elements. Thank you very much for watching.